get on board with what God has for us. We pay attention. We listen up. God will bless us. And God bless Pastor Deacon. Don't run off for a second, Brother Travis. You stay right there. Come here, Brother Lucky. Come here. Yes. You stand right here. Brother Lucky, stand at them doors right there, would you? Them double doors. Come here, Brother Travis. Right about, about right here. Right there. You got it. Man, I tell you, you guys are on target. You know, now you. You know, I double check. Brother Lucky did such a wonderful job this morning. And uh, I told him, I said, you said something this morning that was going right along what I preached. See, I, I like to know I'm in the right vein. Brother Travis don't know it. But he said something this morning that goes right along just in a few words that he was speaking what I'm getting ready to say this morning. I feel like I was when I was I was a young fellow. One of the first things they taught you when you played baseball was, especially if you was in the outfield, Brother Lucky. Amen. And I also learned the same principle back in the military. When you're aiming for something, you used to have to run out what they called aiming stakes. You run them out here like this, and you, you plop one at 50 yards, and you throw another one at 100 yards. It always worked the same principle because if you could stay lined up, amen, with what they had going on, if you could line up with what's being said or you could line up with the principles there. You had the correct balance of what you needed to see, and you had a straight vision to what needed to take place. Amen. I'm going to tell you, amen, I'm in the Lord here this morning. Amen. From what these men have already said, I know I'm where I need to be at. Amen. What I'm trying to tell you is I need you to see it too this morning. I need you to see what's going to be said here today. Because if you're listening to what he had to say, and the few things he had to say while he was up here, I assure you what I've got to say this morning, Eben, will tie into everything because it comes from the Lord. Eben, and I want you to take it to heart. Eben, would you do that for me this morning? Take it to heart. Because God's got a word for you today if you'll listen and you put your mind to it and you hear it. Eben, being hearers of the word this morning. Eben, y'all can be seated. Thank you for uh, standing, Brother Lucky and uh, Brother Travis. I appreciate that. I don't know where that comes from. Amen. But I rebuke it in Jesus' name, whatever that was. I'll not be hindered by radio backtalk. Amen. Or whatever you want to call that. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am a praiser of God. Come on, say it to somebody else. Say, I have a voice. Too quiet this morning. Thank you for saying something back. I don't like it when it's too quiet. I don't. It's not Pentecostal to me. We're apostolic folks. We're a lively bunch. and I don't know if you've ever seen lively kids. I know I've seen lively children, okay? We've been around a bunch over the years, and they ain't never quiet. The Bible tells me you're a bunch of lively stones. Amen? You're living creatures here. You're not dead creatures. You're living creatures. And living creatures got things to say. And living creatures, amen, have movement to them, amen. And not just moving to the restroom. Well, I'm just telling you, amen. I'm a firm believer, amen. If the only move we make is to the restroom, I don't know, man. I think we might have some issues here, amen. But I believe in clapping my hands unto the Lord and... Can I tell you what I believe in this morning? Is that okay for just a few minutes? I think it might help you to know what I believe in this morning. I believe Jesus is first and foremost, amen, the most important thing in my life and in my world. Don't get me wrong, I love my wife, I love my children, I love everything that God has put around my world, but Jesus is the focal point of my world today, amen? Uh, Jesus is the focal point uh, of my worship, uh, He's the focal point uh, of my praise here today, uh, He's the focal point uh, of my thank you unto God, uh, He is the focal point uh, of why I get up every morning, uh, He's the focal point, uh, amen, when I go to bed at night, uh, He's the focal point, uh, amen, of what I'm looking at, I I got an aiming stake today, amen. Uh, his 
Hey, God didn't make this hard. He made it real, real easy. He gave us a focal point in our life that if you'll keep your eyes on Jesus, if you'll start focusing on Jesus and stop focusing on yourself, and you start focusing on Him, He'll make everything that's going on around you right. Amen. He'll take care of bill problems. He'll take care of problems in your life that are relationship oriented. He'll take care of problems that are going on around you in every direction if we will keep Him first. When's the last time you fasted without it being court ordered? That's what I call court order fast. You know what I mean when we do it from up here. When's the last time you just had a praise out at your house? Just started worshiping God because you felt like, you know what, He's awful good today. I think I'm going to praise Him today because you know what, He is worthy of my... You know, it never hurt to have a shout down in your world every now and then. Just saying, you know, Lord Jesus, I'm sick and tired of being depressed and miserable and just all the time complaining about everything about everything under the sun. My goodness, it'd be good for us to every now and then stop focusing on the stuff that's going wrong, but focus on the one thing that's always right. Hey, I'm telling you folks, hey man, I... He's the only thing I know to turn to. He's the only answer to every question I've ever had. He's the only thing that's ever done me right in every way. I have no complaints against Him. Albeit He, He may have complaints against me. But He said He chooses to forgive me. What I ask for. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you today. T.F. Tenney said it best. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Exodus chapter 16, verse 4 and 5. We're reading that in 12 through 15 this morning. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them. I want you to hear that part. They're going to gather bread so he can prove them? We thought we were just hungry. No, he said, I'm going to prove you what I'm giving you. Come on, we just stop thinking about man and we forget about the other stuff that's in it. Come on, he said, I'm going to prove you. Amen. Whether they will walk in my law or not. You mean if I rain something from heaven, it's going to determine whether I walk in his law or not? You give me something free, and it's going to come from heaven. And it's going to make a determinate counsel to me whether I choose to serve you or not. That's an amazing thing to me. Give me verse 12. I'm going to skip down a little bit. I don't want to read all the other stuff. Not that it's not important. It's just not important for this message. I have heard the murmuring of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At evening you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Now this murmuring here was because they didn't have food when they first came out of Egypt. And they said, What are we going to do out in this wilderness? This is the Exodus journey here. What are we going to do out in this wilderness for food? You drug us out here five, six million strong into a wilderness. Ain't no food out here, dude. Moses, you're not a very good general and you're not a very good pastor. You don't know what you're doing. It wasn't Moses' job to supply the food. It was God's job to supply the food. It was their job to get it. And it came to pass that in the evening the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew lay round about the host. You read that. Go back to that. We're going to slow this down a little bit. Right? Can't miss this stuff, folks. Sometimes we just gloss over things. It came to pass as the evening quails came up and covered the camp. In the morning, the dew lay round about the host. The dew was all around them. In verse 14. And when the dew that lay was gone up, 
It was going up. Behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small, round thing. As small as the hoarfrost on the ground. Now, let's stop real quick there. It doesn't say the color of the hoarfrost. A lot of people get this confused saying that manna was white. No, no. It says it was as small as the hoarfrost that comes on the ground. Don't you hear that now? It was small, round thing. It does tell us it was small. It tells us it was round. Amen. As the hoarfrost on the ground, amen, that's how small it was. It was small as frost. That didn't look like frost. It was small as frost. Amen. Verse 15. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna. What simply means, what is it? Don't know what it is. Let's say it again. I don't know what it is. For they wist not what it was, as Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what He's given you to eat. Let's go to Numbers chapter 11. We're going to read about another time when manna begins to fall. But in a different concept. When the people complained, here we go again. It displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and His anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Now listen. It was the fringe group that was complaining again, like they always are. It's always those folks that sit on the outside, don't want to come on in. They want to sit on the outside. They want to listen to all those guys, amen, that are talking to them because they sit too close to the wall instead of getting inside the city. They're not sure where they want to be in the world. They want to serve God, so they hang out on the wall and say, well, today I'll be with the godly people. Tomorrow I'll be with the worldly people. Hop scotch and I hop in and I hop in and I hop out. And it displeased the Lord. And the, the Lord heard it. His anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses. And when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. He said, I'm going to give you a go-between to talk to. Amen. Y'all want to hold all this stuff in all the time, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to cause you issues. And he called the name of the place Taborah because the fire of the Lord burnt among them means a burning place. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. Man, you got to be kidding me. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We're sick of all this church stuff. I want to miss Sunday and play Nintendo. I want football games on. Y'all getting this? Well, I need all this church stuff for. What you think about that for a minute? He said, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. Now here, here's the part I like. The cucumbers and the melons. We had some good stuff in Egypt. Well, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. Some good stuff there, but guess what else it's got? Leeks and onions and garlic, stuff that makes your breath bad. Y'all don't know what bad breath is? Apparently you never ate onions. Uh, let me, let me, I, I got to throw this interjection in here. I, I thank you all for that $25 or $30, I think it was, or whatever it was, gift tip that y'all got us. We used that finally. We had the opportunity to. And I had a blooming onion. And I want you to know that I've never been more thankful for something in my entire life that was so tasty. My breath was horrible after that. I didn't care. I hadn't had one of them in years, and it was really, really good, man, I'm telling you. Just thought I'd throw that in for a commercial. Now let's get back to business. But now, he said, our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all besides this Sunday morning church stuff. Before our eyes. It's all I can see. Sunday morning. Thank God I have a Saturday. Or I'd never get no relief. Oh, 
it's the only day I get. I hate to tell you something, folks. You need to rethink some things in your life. And the manna was as coriander seed. Oh, that's what it tells us. And the color thereof is the color of bedelium. It's a type of gum, and I'll tell you what color it is here shortly. And all the people that went about and gathered it, ground it in the mills, they beat it in a mortar, and they baked it in pans and made cakes of it. They said, patty cake, patty cake, baker's man, take me to church as slow as you can. <clears throat> and the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. I'll say that again. When you worked it, you got oil. When you just received it and ate it, but when you worked the plan, when you worked it a little bit, you did something with it itself. I'm just topical in here right now. Just bear with me. You got something out of it. It changed its flavor when you allowed it to work in your life. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. Now, wait a minute. Before the dew went up and you got it, now the manna's falling. I mean, the dew's falling and you're getting it. I, I want to preach to you just a little bit. I, I won't be long-winded. I won't do it. I try not to anyway. Unless I get all excited. I ain't making no promises. When what became who and who became what? Yeah, that's a tongue twister for you. You come say this after you leave church tonight. That's right. I said tonight we're going to be here a while. When what became who? And who became what? Pastor Smith, will you do me the honor of praying over this message today? make this very clear. We know what the subject here is. We're talking about manna that came from heaven. This is God's gift to us. When you come out of Egypt, He's got a gift for you. He's got something designed for you. Amen. That you ought not complain about. Because it's coming from above. Now if I give you a gift, you might complain. Because I might not give you the best of God. I don't know. If I got, you know how it is when you got two of something, you give one away, you don't ever give them your best when you give them the. Well, I, I, well, I, see that, Jesus don't work like that, but I have to admit, sometimes I do. If I got two hammers, I'm not going to give you the good one, I'm going to give you the not so good one. I want to keep the good one for myself. Amen. Their manna had fallen. They said, what is this stuff that's coming from? What is it? I don't know what it is. What, what do we got going on here? I mean, this is how you're going to feed us. So in the morning, you know, the, when the dew goes up in the morning, all of a sudden something's going to be left there for us. And, and when the dew falls at night, now something's going to be left there for us. A little bit later on we found out. And we, so it has this unique delivery system that God brings it to us by. It's unique in the fact that Apparently, it didn't come from animals. You know, let me tell you something. God's not looking to tear you up. When He gives you things, it's for your benefit, never for your hurt. This did not come from something that's of a lower life form. This did not come from something that's, from, that's actually beneath you. Amen? This came from something that was above you. No, it didn't, it, it doesn't say that it came from the dirt where folks are rooting around the dirt to pick it up. It doesn't say it was some kind of dirty, muddy mess. See, man, it, instead it said it was apparently encased in the dew. It was in a bubble. It was wrapped in it. That's why Brother Lucky didn't know it, but I had a fit this morning one back there and I'm sitting in my seat back there. It was in a bubble. It was wrapped up. Designed for them, protected from the things beneath and from the things that were on this world. 
But when it went on the, however it was delivered onto the ground and wherever it fell and however it fell, he meant it was not going to be some kind of muddy mess that they had to grab. Instead, you know, anybody ever eat food that's been in the dirt? Come on. I mean, I know, a little dirt, never hurt. I know all that stuff. Don't get me wrong. Amen. But uh, the three-second rule and all that kind of stuff. It, I don't care what you do. You drop something in my house, it's going to have dog hair on it probably. I don't care what you try to do. You can sweep that place up a thousand times and some hair will find you somewhere. And I guarantee you anything I've ever dropped in that house, I've done it. I've, well, I'll just grab it. Well, guess not. Put it away. But God's design for you was saying this is going to come to you. It's going to be protected when you get it. When you get it, it's going to be pure for you. When you get it, it's going to be something to be desired. Amen. Even if you don't exactly know exactly what it is. You see, folks, I'm telling you right now, we have an issue today. We don't know what we got in Jesus Christ. Can I just, let me just put this to you. Can I do that? This manna was nothing more than the true bread that came down from heaven. And Jesus said He was. Amen. He was the manna that came from heaven that was given unto us. Amen. It was protected from above and it was protected from beneath. That means when you taste of it, when you grab a hold of it, and you work it into your life, and you grab it into your life, let me tell you what it's going to do for you. Amen. It's going to keep you protected from those that work above you and the principalities and rulers of wickedness that are in high places. And it's going to protect you from the beggarly elements that are below you. Amen. That would seek your harm and that would seek your hurt. That's why I do believe it's very important in our life that we might want to get Jesus into our world and into our vocabulary and into our lifestyle and everything we're doing. It might help us if we focus upon Him and the things of His kingdom and stop worrying about our kingdoms and start worrying about His kingdom. Spend so much time murmuring and complaining about the goodness of God. What He has done, as if wearing Jesus is a badge of hate and shame. God gave us Him. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The one thing that God gives us why is it the one thing sometimes we despise? I wish I could be like them and do all the stuff that they do. I go to church. Come on, Brother Schlepprock. Wowsy, wowsy, woo woo. I go to church. I don't get to do what they do, I don't get to wear what they wear. I Honey, but they don't get to go where you go. They're not going to see a place that you get to see. Matter of fact, you ought to feel sorry for them and not, oh, and not desire them, but desire Him. Because when you desire Him, I'm going to tell you what it's going to do. It'll change your world. It'll change your thinking. It'll change your life. When you get him, you don't get so easily offended. You don't, you just don't get so easy, you know, not, not, not a whole lot just offends you. My goodness. You see, uh, y'all have to help me for a second here. I'm, I, I want to try to get to something here before I do. You need to see this first. This delivery system was unique. I, 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 bear with me. I've got to explain this right so I don't get you lost. See, in Genesis chapter 1, we, we found the same thing. Same delivery system from God. And He divided the waters from the waters. He put one bottle above and one bottle below. And He put the earth in between. Now let me say this again. I hate using the word earth here because in the Hebrew that word is Adam. Where we get the name Adam from. He put the Adam that he had prepared this earth for in between the two waters. And it was supposed to be a gift to this earth because it gave them someone to reign and to rule on. But 
when Adam fell and death entered into this world, the murmuring and the complaining began. Folks, what I'm trying to get at here is simple. God's got a delivery system for you. You see, it comes in the form of dew. And you'll find Jesus right in the middle of it. Brother Travis, you see, when the praises go up, the blessings come down. When you throw up, <laughs> you've got to be an active participant in this. Come on. Here he gave them away because they didn't understand anything. But see, we don't have that excuse. They didn't understand. They just complained that's all they knew to do because that's what sin does. And the law was imperfect, so they all they knew how to do was complain. That's what they do. But folks that know Jesus ought not be complainers. Let me say it again. Debbie Downer. Danny Depression. Mr. I complain and cry and moan all the time. Please quiet yourself and get your mind on Jesus once in a while. Stop focusing on the things that are going wrong and start focusing on the one thing that goes right all the time. Come on. I'm trying to help you with something here. You, sometimes we struggle too much with stuff we ought not be struggling with. They had a right to complain because they didn't have that which was perfect had not come yet. Amen. But we don't have that right to complain. You know what he tells us to do in the midst of storms, in the midst of depression, and in the midst of defeat? He said you begin to praise Him. You start sending some dew up in the morning. Amen. Early in the morning will I seek Thee, O God. Early in the morning, amen, will I seek Thee, O God. He said weeping may endure for the night, but joy. Hey, you might have some tears flowing down in the night season, but you've got some praise that's going to go up in the morning. And encased in all of that, there's a blessing that's coming to you because you're an active participant in this. God says, listen, if you want something from Him now, if you want it now, there's got to be some praise that goes from your lips up to the throne of God and from the Lamb. But if you'll praise Him, if you'll worship Him, if you'll magnify Him, He's going to send something back down to you today. If you'll send it up, He'll send it down. If you'll send it up, He'll send it down. Instead of sit there in your prayer room complaining all day long. Why don't you get up once in a while? He already gave you the answer. Get on your feet. Lift them hands to heaven and magnify. Magnify God with all your heart and say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Boy, it wouldn't hurt us to get up out of our seat. We sit it all day long. Get through him. Can we praise the Lord for a moment, please? Well, it's your service. You do with it what you want.
Come on, the devil's already looking at some. He said, I hope, brother, you don't preach too long. I'm just getting started. You're in trouble. Put your eyes on Jesus first. And you start talking to Him about North Korea. And you start talking to Him about your workplace. And you start talking to Him about your family. And you start talking to Him about everything you got going on. These things are all important. But not until you go through the lens of Jesus Christ. We can't do anything outside of Him. You see, when the manna first came, it was small. It speaks of the humility of Jesus Christ because He is the creator of the universe, yet He came into a world manifest Himself in the flesh. He humbled Himself and became a servant so that He might die for His people on a cross called Calvary. It was round like a circle that has no beginning or no ending. Jesus Christ was the great God-man. All God and all man. The finite of humanity with the infinity of God. It was the color of bedelium in the shape of the coriander seed. And I wish I had a picture of it up here. If I'd have done my homework, I'd have had one put up here. The coriander seed, if you've ever seen it, was a seed with many stripes built into it. Lumpy. It looks like it's been beaten. Can I say it like that? Bedelium gum is an aromatic resin with a unique color. It has the color of a purplish and a golden hue, much like the color of a bruise. You see, this manna was, didn't just come any old way. Exodus didn't give us the whole story, but Numbers did. You see, Exodus' story was the folks that didn't know him right. Hadn't been with him yet. But when they had been with him a while, in numbers, and yet they still found a way to look for Egypt, start complaining again about Egypt. God said, you've got to work this thing. You've got to be able to put it into cakes, and you've got to be able to put it in the mill. You have to grind him up. In other words, you, you have to put him to work in your life. We do too many things outside of Jesus Christ. We don't even ask Him anymore. We just go do stuff and say there must be in the will of God. It came at night. And of course Jesus was born on a dark night in Judea. He came into a world trapped in the spiritual darkness to bring light and love and life to a world. It was misunderstood by those who found it. They called it manna. What? Is it? Jesus was misunderstood by everybody. Matter of fact, even the people he saved, he was misunderstood by. He had to tell them, my kingdom's not of this world. You don't get it. 
I'm not here to put a crown on me here while I'm here. I'm here to bear a cross. That's why what became who? Which was Jesus Christ. It was sufficient for everyone's need. Everyone's need. Let me say it again. Everyone's need. Whatever you got going on, He's sufficient for. Let me say a little personal note here. He was sufficient for Paul even though he never healed him. He might be sufficient for you if you never get healed. Doesn't make him any less God. He heals us to save us. The reason He heals is so folks that are healed realize if He's got the power to heal me, He's got the power to save me. The folks know that who has the power to save Him already. It doesn't mean He won't heal. Sometimes He doesn't. But He's still sufficient for your need. It was sweet to the taste. Wafers made with honey, I think they called it. A pleasant surprise to everyone who placed it on the tongue. It's a great picture of the Lord. To the sin of Jesus appears to be harsh, some kind of cosmic killjoy. Come on, that's what they think about you church folks. Come on, they can't drink till you leave the wedding. They can't dance and act a fool till you leave the wedding. Even the Christian folks. The so-called Christian ones. He's the delight of every soul. You'll find He makes life worth living. The songwriter said, Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. The psalmist said it this way, Oh, taste and see that the Lord, He is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in Him. Folks, it was to be kept and passed on to others. Jesus is the same way. You're supposed to keep Him, but you're also supposed to pass Him on to others. So it ain't just, why come to church every Sunday, but you never outreach. You have no personal outreach in your whole life. Come on. It was to be gathered for six days, but on the seventh day, it was not to be gathered. You see, you can't gather him when he was under the ground, when he was buried in a tomb. You couldn't gather him then. But thank God the dew wasn't just coming, coming down. It was also Ascending up. The manna just wasn't coming down from heaven. He said, but when the dew ascended in the morning, there was something that was left for you. Amen. In Jesus Christ. What am I saying? I'll tell you what I'm trying to say. I'm going to get here in just a minute. They asked the question, what manna was, and they found out it was Jesus Christ. What became the who? But a unique thing began to happen after he ascended. He descended again. He came back down. On the day of Pentecost, there's 120 in the upper room and they're hanging out. Trying to start feeding somebody something again. Going to put something in them. You don't have to gather six days on the seventh. No, no. This is going to stay with you seven days a week. Whether you're in the morning when you wake up or in the evening when you go to bed. 
For he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor does he sleep. Amen. Uh, but he'll watch over you while you're in your bed at night now. Amen. Uh, he's going to be provision for you uh, in the morning when you wake up. Uh, and when you go to bed at night, uh, he's going to be there for you. Amen. Uh, he's going to be with you uh, wherever you go. Amen. He said, Lo, uh, I'll be with you always, uh, even until uh, the end uh, of the world. As a matter of fact, uh, amen, when he fell on the day of Pentecost uh, with his spirit, amen, uh, fell back into us. Amen. Uh, and they began to speak it up the tongues in this upper room, folks started looking going, what is it? The reality was it wasn't a what, it was really a who. You see, because when what became who and who became what, they're still trying to figure out who what is. You go take that one with you. Come on, preacher, try to re-preach this one. What I'm trying to tell you is this. He's given us manna today. That's why you need to be full of the Holy Ghost, brother. Like you. You've got to be encased in Jesus Christ. You've got to bubble yourself up. Put me in bubble wrap and nobody burst my bubble, please. Amen. Because our focus and our care must be with Him. You see, the real problem, folks, is not Jesus. We think it's Him. Sometimes we think that way. Well, I'm doing everything I know to do. No, you're not. Watch me. You say this stuff. I'm doing everything I... I've said it. Anybody else ever said this? Everybody just the only one around here and y'all are just going to lie. Okay, well, fine. Be that way. I've said it. Brother Smith, I'm doing everything I know to do. But deep down, there's, there's one more thing I know I could have done. That dawning 40-day fast didn't look so good for me. Or that extra hour of prayer I said I'd do. Somehow I always got thwarted. All the promises I made that I never really got to. Even though my heart was in the right place, reality can be rough. So what do you do? What you do is this. You go get Jesus and you put him in the focus again. So Lord, I've got all focus again. I'm looking left, I'm looking right, and I'm not looking at you. Let's put you first. Let's put you first. Here's the thing about it. No matter what we do sometimes, no matter how we say it, never look at Egypt for an answer. Never turn yourself that way and start turning your back on God, start turning the direction of Egypt again. But Egypt's got Nintendo. Egypt's got a neat TV show I can watch that will take me away from all this. I know I probably shouldn't watch that movie, but man, it just intrigues me so much. I just hung up on this stuff. I know I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't. Then you shouldn't. We've got to encase ourselves in Him. Encase ourselves in Him. Encase ourselves in Him. Because if we'll bubble wrap Him around our world, my goodness. The Apostle Paul said it like this. I'm finishing. I promise I'm done. We walk circumspectly. It's round. It's a little, but it's mild. I gotta walk circumspectly. I gotta keep my eye out. I gotta keep my eye out. You see, because what you don't understand is while you're walking over here, Jesus on the other side of you walking over here. <laughs> For he to keep his Israel, he slumbers or slumbers. <laughs> He's already watching your back. He's watching the rear guard of the redeemed. Amen. He's simply saying is while you're watching the front, if you'll keep focused, you don't have to worry about anything coming behind you. Nothing will ever take you by surprise. Let's all stand.